Hello traders, it's Wednesday, October the 10th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. It's your market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade. And more importantly, now look for what we can expect in the next 24 to 48 hours ahead of us. Well, we start off not with the general concept of risk trends. We will get to that. Uh, but we are hovering in kind of a purgatory, not really committed to unwinding from the excess uh, level of complacency and exposure that we've been seeing from the likes of the S&P 500 for months, uh, but certainly not enthusiastic enough to mount a meaningful recovery. And what will tip the scales at this kind of level, uh, either marking the uh, S&P 500 as the leader for optimism or whether uh, this uh, milestone simply conforms to the rest of the world uh, like the VEU is reflecting, will depend upon catalysts. Uh, one of the catalysts that has been most provocative over the past week plus has been the rise in treasury yields. Now, it's not novel at all that U.S. 10-year Treasury yields have been on the rise. They've been on the rise for quite a long time, as you can see here, uh, over a year. Uh, but it is, however, unusual just this past week that this motivation, this charge forward, was joined by other countries' 10-year government bond yields. Uh, but that enthusiasm has died out before it has hit critical mass. So this is the German 10-year yield, and this is the Japanese 10-year yield, which, I mean, comparing the two of them, this is far more remarkable, considering that the Bank of Japan actually has a policy in place meant to curb the appreciation of this yield. But we do have a lack of conviction a lack of fundamental momentum that would put all of these yields into uh, a climb. Uh, and this is actually the uh, a, uh, aggregate of the 10-year yields between the U.S., the U.K., Germany, and Japan, uh, four of the largest uh, government bond markets in the world. And you can still see that we're exceptionally high, but momentum is necessary if this is going to transition into that tension, that pressure that we had seen this past trading week. I think this has the greatest capacity of actually m motivating such uh, a prominent concern in financial health, even though it does have its positive connotation. A rise in, in benchmark rates, consider that back in July 2016, we were talking about an aggregate of these four, where rates... Uh, the baseline of rates, which all the returns that we collect as investors, whether that be in dividend format from equities, whether that be in blue chip bonds, whether that be in high yield fixed income bonds or emerging markets, it, it's founded on this, uh, so to speak, risk-free return. It is a premium above that risk-free. So the fact that we've advanced from what was essentially 1.5 for the aggregate of these four now up to 5.5, so an additional 4 percentage points of return, this should encourage sentiment. But instead, it, we've already seen that the sentiment has run well beyond the capacity of what we expect in, in actual return uh, measures, and instead we see it as the cost. And yes, there is a cost that comes out of this, a cost of capital, which is why this rise in uh, debt, facilitation has started to put serious pressure on the likes of the emerging markets where the need for funds is explicit to keep a heavily over-risked uh, asset uh, buoyant. So yields is an area of this market that I think we need to keep very close tabs on but we shouldn't just necessarily expect it's going to find follow-through just because the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield has gotten above uh, 3.2 or uh, the Japanese JGB is starting to rise with a little bit more conviction does not mean that this is a break with trend intent. It does, however, signify uh, a erosion of complacency and a recognition of genuine cost, which will tip that risk-reward balance in such a way that we just can't ignore that risks are higher. It's actually a higher cost and a lower return. All right, so keeping an eye on this, but 
As we await to see what the next move in global yields are, we do have other fundamental themes ongoing, uh, certain headlines. Uh, one of the remarkable headlines that we had seen this past session had come from the World uh, Economic Outlook from the IMF. So the, uh, the week summit in Bali, a good place to have such a summit, uh, between the IMF and World Bank representatives usually accompanies an updated forecast for uh, the global economy, uh, which is followed by a financial stability report, uh, which is in, the, uh, in turn followed by a financial monitor, which is a fiscal spending. We'll get that series this week. And unfortunately, we didn't have good, uh, reliable times and date releases for these reports. Uh, until now, uh, we did have the World Economic Outlook uh, re released this past session to GMT uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, and as could be expected, the outcome was certainly not very encouraging. It was downright disappointing. Uh, the outlook for global growth was actually downgraded uh, for 2018 and 2019 from 3.9% down to 3.7 for both years. Uh, the reasoning was not unexpected. It was a reference to the U.S.-China trade wars, just general trade war tension and uncertainties that knock on effect there. Uh, a weak economic performance specifically from the Eurozone and the U.K. and Japan, the first two obviously uh, going through uh, uncertainty with their respective uh, uh, union uh, stability factors. Uh, and also the motivation of capital outflow, emerging market outflow uh, from that uh, otherwise sensitive region of high return uh, world investment uh, catalyst. And that was uh, in large part uh, sparked by uh, the tightening of monetary policy, so the Fed's rate hikes, which uh, inevitably will have an impact on the financial system, not just in the U.S., but globally. The U.S. and China specifically uh, maintain stable growth forecasts for 2018, 2.9 and 6.6% .6 respectively, but each did receive a 0.2 percentage point downgrade to their 2019 growth forecasts, obviously a, uh, a reflection of the uh, impact of these trade wars, amongst other things, uh, and they explicitly uh, issued a warning on China uh, for... It's delicate balance and the threat of uh, of losing the, the, the control over a, uh, a coordination between economic growth and financial stability, which it seems the Trump administration is pushing heavily against. All right. So a lot of concern. Um, they even went, uh, went so far as to give forecasts of what would happen to the global economy in an all-out trade war, uh, which would see significant downgrades in global growth, but particularly for the U.S. and China, certainly the emerging markets as well. Uh, and all of it has the capacity of being a concern, and it should be a concern. It is something that we've discussed before that uh, we continue to go down this path. It will have its negative economic implications, but investors uh, are, are finding themselves capable of ignoring those long-term issues because they're, they're focusing on the short-term uh, opportunities. The buy-the-dip mentality is a shorter-term speculative uh, approach with intent only to, uh, to reap the benefits of what's happening now, not to consider what the general environment is for a long-term holding period. All right, that is not the uh, the setting of the speculative rank here and now. But that is a dangerous uh, approach, a dangerous view to maintain because it is inherently supportive of instability. Now, we will have in this upcoming session, probably by the time you watch this, you might even have it across the wires because it's due at 1 GMT, the IMS Global Financial Stability Report. As you can see, I have it in red. That is extremely important uh, because we need to hit upon what the financial implications, liquidity implications are of increasing trade wars. All right. Not to mention other factors like the overuse of leverage, which is a side effect of these very richly priced capital markets. Perhaps you may even weigh in on the uh, exceptionally low use of hedging and uh, the disparity in performance of certain regions and asset classes. 
like the disparity between the U.S. equity market and its global counterparts. Uh, we need to see what they actually tap into. The IMF is pretty good at uh, highlighting serious risks, even if the market overlooks them for the convenience of short-term returns. Uh, they're not as aggressive as the Bank of International Settlements, who are definitely the more concerned bear in, in these uh, supranational groups, but it, they certainly do hit upon things that we don't often see, let's say, when central bankers give their press conference, or certainly when governments will uh, list their concerns. Those are cheerleaders. These are more pragmatic uh, assessors of our current condition. And then, of course, I will also have to highlight in red the IMF's fiscal monitor. Uh, the, the economic outlook was not something that I thought had the highest capacity of the markets, uh, because that's not necessarily going to be a surprise. And uh, the pesky reality of a slower economic expansion doesn't seem to dislodge any investors. But talking about financial stability and liquidity issues, or talking about the fiscal uh, situation of the markets, where it could lead to, let's say, for example, a possible downgrade to the world's largest uh, uh, country's credit ratings, that can be systemically important. Okay, so. Keep an eye on what the IMF and the World Bank uh, leaders have to say and what their assessments are. They are quite serious. Now, outside of uh, the IMF's updates on our current condition, uh, we do have a rather familiar uh, concern that is uh, percolating once again. Uh, for those that uh, weren't trading back then, uh, we had some pretty serious retreat on risk-oriented assets. This is the S&P 500 uh, back in 2015, August 2015 and January 2016. What was the spark of that? It was uh, a reflection on the repricing approach of China on its exchange rate, which it seems very novel now that that would be a concern that it would render or necessitate a uh, response from its global trade partners, essentially putting China at odds with others, <laughs> because now we are clearly at odds, especially between the United States and China, um, and we are not uh, uh, assessing those same kind of risks. But China again is in the news, considering that uh, there is starting to uh, to be apparent uh, financial pressure and stability pressure. Now we don't usually get very good measures of economic uncertainty out of China, nor do we often see the tension in the financial system, where there are signs. We typically start to see them quickly uh, papered over. Uh, to prevent any kind of panic, which would in turn lead to something uncontrollable by the regulators. Here's the USDCNH, uh, and obviously the sharp advance in the exchange rate, which they uh, didn't mind to a certain extent uh, when it meant uh, a cheaper yuan and uh, to put some pain to the uh, the U.S. authorities and offset some of the uh, tariffs that they were applying. Uh, but then they started to see the risk of an assumption uh, in capital flight, which was very problematic. So then the PBOC stepped in and tried to control the exchange rate to prevent it from volatility and momentum. Uh, at that time, we could look at something like the dollar HKD, which continued to hit its head on its uh, its exchange rate limit, and that was evidence that there was still capital flowing out. They stepped up the, uh, their activity in short-term uh, uh, debt facilitation in Hong Kong, which would help to stabilize those concerns. But we're starting to see other areas uh, of liquidity, which can't easily be... Uh, argued away uh, relative to the USDCNH or the USDHKD or even the Shanghai Composite where there is a certain amount of influence. Uh, the Hong Kong bank uh, yuan lending rates, so the, uh, the cost of getting uh, yuan in, for Hong Kong banks uh, was sharply increased recently uh, by uh, I think overnight was something on the order of 1.745%, up to 5%. Uh, so that's a huge jump in costs. And the interest, of course, is to prevent uh, speculative efforts to depreciate the currency, whether directly intentional or uh, uh, by unintended side consequence. Um, and 
that is definitely uh, definitely a sign that there is an effort to pressure this exchange rate and knock uh, China off its ability to balance everything. Now, I still prefer keeping an eye on Aussie USD. I think this is a little bit more market determined uh, as a metric, even for China, given Australia's exposure to China as a trade partner uh, and its ability to utilize China's uh, massive infrastructure spending debt spree uh, back in the great financial crisis to avoid a recession. It's itself. Um, but uh, I, I do think that this is a much better measure. As If we look back over the past few years, China has been, uh, if not the direct cause of a lot of the global risk uh, bouts, uh, it is a major contributor. So you'd be remiss not to keep tabs on China if you are evaluating what, uh, let's say, emerging markets or the S&P 500 is going to do next and when it's going to really start to tip lower. But speaking of uh, some of the traditional things like equities, uh, we do have earnings season coming up uh, starting on Friday. I will keep warning about that. Uh, we will start with the banks and we will have Delta Airlines, which I also think is very important. Banks are not the top of mind when it comes to earnings season nowadays. It's more so the tech companies, the major tech players of the FANG grouping. Uh, but these, when liquidity and financial uncertainties become uh, prominent, uh, we pay a lot of attention to the major players in the financial system, so these banks, including J.P. Morgan, Citi, and Wells Fargo. Uh, we'll also have, uh, uh, well, uh, we did have some anticipation, and we've seen it uh, in certain surveys. Uh, I think Jim Cramer actually uh, issued a warning uh, this morning uh, in one of his uh, appearances in which he said he's been talking to a lot of CEOs, and they're growing more and more concerned about the outlook uh, of earnings going forward as its growth starts to cool uh, in the aftermath of tax cuts starts to ease off and uh, the impact of trade wars starts to really kick in. But we'll come to that relatively soon. In the meantime, we do need to keep general tabs on the course of risk trends. And as always, uh, my favorite measure of risk trends is when there is a high degree of correlation. Add correlation and intensity, and that is a great sign that there is sentiment and control. Whether it's risk on, risk off depends on the circumstance, but it is the correlation itself that really speaks to intensity. And intensity translates into conviction, meaning the ability of following through on it, whether it be risk on, risk off. Uh, but as of uh, this past session, we didn't have a lot of uh, consistency in any kind of risk appetite or risk aversion. So the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial, the NASDAQ 100, uh, they were still offering the stability that Monday had uh, brought, tentatively uh, helped out because the bond market was offline and yields uh, were rising aggressively into the end of last week. Uh, which also translated into a slide in these equity uh, benchmarks. But uh, there's certainly a sense of relief that it is not just tipping over into systemic momentum. Uh, global indices, you have the DAX, which actually had a hard bounce. Look at that tail. Uh, hard bounce on a larger uh, trend line support. You had the FTSE 100, which uh, has its own trend line, not as prominent in my book. Uh, and the FTSE MIB, the Italian bourse, which I've been keeping a closer tab on, uh, actually hit the midpoint of its 2016 low to its 2018 high. All right. So European uh, top flight uh, indices, uh, at least getting some reprieve on technical basis. We'll see if it actually holds up. In Asia, the Nikkei 225 continues its slow slide. The Aussie ASX isn't as nearly as restrained. And the Hang Seng Index, similar to the Shanghai Composite, is essentially leveled out. Uh, not enthusiastic to, uh, in any terms, uh, but certainly not in giving over to risk aversion. Emerging market ETF, the high yield fixed income, also known as junk bond ETF. Uh, the commodities as an asset class, a risk asset. Nice little uh, spike lower there with a large lower wick or lower tail. Uh, and, of course, the FX equivalent of risk trends, the carry trade, which I like to look at an equally weighted uh, yen index, also had something of a, st a stabilization uh, session. So we don't have 
committed risk aversion. It's still leaning in that direction in the short term, but medium term is still bullish. It's just a con uh, it's just a question of when the next catalyst is com going to come along and tip uh, a leverage, tip a correlation, and put us back into pace. And that's not particularly clear about what's going to be capable of achieving that and whether we're just going to naturally spill over into the systemic uh, category rather than just a, a tailored uh, one-off risk move. Uh, but I do think that these IMF uh, global reports are going to be of a little bit more prominence. We can also have uh, or add back into the mix uh, some of the more I guess at this point, traditional measures uh, uh, or catalysts of risk trends. We did have this past session, U.S. President Donald Trump uh, once again reiterating that he's willing to do two, the additional $267 billion in, in tariffs against China, so essentially put tariffs against all of Chinese imports. Um, if they retaliate, they did retaliate uh, to his last move, which was a $200 billion uh, in goods upgrade. Um, so I, I don't know if that means that he intends to go forward with it because they did, or uh, maybe he's just waiting to see if they're going to do more, and this is already tolerable. Uh, it's not clear. Uh, but as is quite uh, obvious with uh, the U.S. president, you need to be very careful about uh, sudden changes in, in view. Uh, also, looking at the dollar, we had another reference from the U.S. president uh, to the central bank, the Federal Reserve. The, uh, the, the Fed, uh, or sorry, the uh, U.S. president had once again voiced his concern uh, that the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates and that he doesn't actually like what they're doing, um, suggesting that they're not facing any inflation problems uh, and... Uh, uh, softly critiquing them. Clearly, the president doesn't like the currency, and this is one of my general concerns. It's kind of a, a backstop, if you will. If the dollar did manage to avoid its exposure as a carry currency and risk aversion, uh, or uh, the blowback that it gets from being at the center of so many trade war uh, instigations, uh, then you still have an issue that the, uh, the Trump administration does not want a strong dollar because it adds additional pressure to a growing debt load. Uh, and they've been very vocal about this, not just the U.S. president, but the Treasury Secretary and his chief economic advisor as well, uh, backing out of the the explicit strong dollar rhetoric. Uh, but if they get a little bit more explicit about their disinterest for the dollar or their, dis, uh, their spite for a high dollar, then be mindful. The market will take note and they'll take it as indication that there is going to be an active effort to push the currency down. If they, we get into that, things are going to get very wild in the financial world and uh, currencies will see a, uh, a very easy doubling of volatility measures. Uh, so the broad volatility index would easily jump from its general range of about 7 to 8 percentage points up to 14, 15, 16 rather easily in that kind of scenario. So be mindful. Uh, I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but if it does, it will be quite significant. I'll point out that the DXY has a nice rounding here, uh, and this is the, uh, if we do see a kind of uh, completion of this uh, this reversal, uh, it fits nicely to the range conditions that we have, generally speaking, for the FX market, the lack of uh, conviction that I have for a bullish medium-term view on the greenback, uh, and it would complete a head and shoulders pattern, although I would not uh, draw too much in the way of implications or in insinuation from that technical pattern beyond just capable of moving back into range. Uh, I think it's an interesting comparison to the likes of the uh, equally weighted dollar index, which you see here. Uh, it actually took over or overtook its uh, its August uh, high, and it's a little bit more uh, clear or straightforward of its intent to potentially correct, uh, and that's because it de-emphasizes the euro USD, which is essentially a mirror of what the DXY shows. So. There is intent here, there's opportunity here, but I would say wait for a catalyst, uh, both fundamental and technical. Although, in these kind of terms, I often say that it's very important to look for the confluence of a, of a very convincing fundamental uh, term and a technical picture. But 
in this case, uh, the fundamentals are less important. So long as they aren't a conflict to the move, if a market is essentially moving back into range, which if this does, uh, the euro USD, for example, starts to break higher, it is a move back into a range. If this is just a move back into a range as the dollar retreats and the, or the euro passively advances, it's more of a dollar retreat, um, that wouldn't necessarily prevent me from getting involved because a path least resistance is a much easier technical and speculative uh, development to facilitate than one that is is, let's say, trying to force a break uh, into uncharted territory. All right, a break to the upside for the US dollar and to sustain that into a tradable move is more difficult to actually facilitate than just a pullback into an established range because this is probably a lot of speculative interest that is weakly held that can unwind and pull us back. So keeping an eye on that and looking across the dollar-based majors, uh, EURUSD is probably one of the better uh, 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 oriented for this. You can also look at something like the dollar swish, which I think is actually very good for this, even though this was frank, is uh, throwing up some interesting technical picture itself. Uh, I don't think it would restrict this. Dollar yen, add a little bit of risk aversion to it, and yes, this will come back into appeal for me. If you recall, oh, that's a really short time frame. Uh, if you recall, I actually had a short back when we were at that trend line. It broke to the upside and stopped me out, but I said I'd like to get back in if the criteria are met. Uh, we're still, uh, after the head and shoulders pattern, we're, we're deeper into it. Uh, I would prefer this have risk aversion associated to it, but other dollar-based pairs like the Euro USD don't have the higher level of requirements or the dollar Swiss. Uh, we do have some other fundamental things going on with the dollar. Uh, well, the, the docket uh, is certainly going to produce inflation expectations and uh, Fed speak and housing data. But I think that more important is the r remarks from the Fed, the reflection, or sorry, the remarks from the President, uh, reflections from the IMF, uh, and the general course of uh, bigger picture thematic issues are much more interesting when it comes to directing the dollar's next move. Uh, another currency that was pretty active in the morning, especially in the London hours, uh, the late London hours, is the British pound. Obviously, we know what the motivator is here. It's Brexit, either clarity or uh, a breakdown in the conviction and the direction that we're going to find. Uh, one way or the other, that is a motivator for the sterling. Uh, but you need a clarity on that theme. What was interesting and helped motivate the sterling, this equally weighted sterling measure, uh, to a rebound through this past session, if you look at a shorter time frame chart, you see it a little bit more uh, readily, was a headline, which even on the face of it looked a little bit too enthusiastic and un un unrealistic, uh, but the suggestion that the, the uh, EU and the UK could have a... Uh, 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 an agreement in place in days, which obviously was unrealistic, uh, but then suggesting it can go out to October and the October summit, which was uh, reiterated by uh, the Brexit minister, Rob, uh, but he was also there talking about uh, uh, certainly no interest in an indefinite customs union with a backstop or uh, continuing to prepare for a no uh, deal outcome. I mean, that, that helps to, to squelch some of that enthusiasm enthusiasm, and in turn, the sterling would not go for any serious moves. Uh, ahead, we will have more traditional economic doc and data from the docket, and this is important uh, content for the UK's uh, health and the sterling's health, but it will not be easy to unseat a focus on the Brexit. I don't expect it to do so unless it is a very severe update. Two other currencies that I'm keeping close tabs on, but they are lacking for uh, explicit uh, uh, fundamental catalysts. They do have their themes, but I think that the themes are l less uh, uh, charged and uh, explicit in terms of timing. The equally weighted Canadian dollar, a nice retreat, that relief rally post-NAFTA negotiation uh, is already has already capped itself, started to retreat. Uh, you can find some interesting ca Canadian dollar crosses uh, that can uh, take advantage of this if it does continue. Continue. And then the equally weighted Swiss franc, which is still, the, the Swiss are still trying to deal with the EU and working out of treaties and trade. Um, this can continue after some consolidation to break lower and a retreat for the Swiss franc, or it could uh, find a bounce. Uh, 
and I'm waiting to find a uh, an explicit view one way or the other. Again, dollar Swiss might be interesting for this, more so for the Swiss franc uh, recovering to take advantage of the weak dollar, or the Euro Swiss extending its move below 1450 if it's the Swiss franc weakening. But I'm definitely keeping this in mind. A quick review of the commodity market. Gold uh, didn't make any kind of uh, design, significant designs uh, to bounce off of the lower end of its range. That uh, 12, 10, 12, 15 to uh, down here 1180, 1184 uh, still stands as a general congestion. Uh, if you really want to see the high profile moves, the big trend based drives, uh, we're going to have to tap into s some systemic issue. Uh, one of those considerations will be what happens with uh, yields, global yields. Uh, and as global yields rise significantly, uh, it's a greater pressure for gold to continue to decline as an alternative to these traditional uh, uh, fiat assets, these yield-bearing assets. Uh, otherwise, if we have risk aversion uh, in significant amounts, which really highlights the limitations of central banks to fight the fire, that will put this back into a bid. And it's that scenario that I'm keeping this as, an, as a kind of a, a safety option. If we do tip into risk aversion, serious risk aversion, this will be one of my favorite places to go to. Uh, and finally, crude oil. Uh, we did have a, a, a rebound, uh, not a, a, a very dramatic one, but it's the first advance that we've seen in, in four trading sessions. And this is motivated in part by traditional uh, fundamentals. Uh, the, uh, the storm in the Gulf of Mexico has actually uh, increased in intensity to uh, now Hurricane Michael is heading towards um, the Florida Panhandle and it's actually taken off about a fifth of the Gulf production of oil, about 325,000 barrels per day. That's a supply pinch and it does help that supply demand factor with the market already rising it's no surprise that it actually uh, takes to that news it doesn't have great capacity for follow-through inherently but it is enough that it is actually spilling over to UK oil which is significant because this doesn't really have that uh, direct of a, a, a feed into US production there is still a very significant difference in the Brent uh, WTI uh, uh, price differential. And you can see that we are still above $10 difference in those benchmark uh, commodity uh, measures. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there.